So hopefully he'll be back again soon. Um, so he uh, is a professor now at University of Maryland. He was at Georgia Tech. Um, he wrote a book which is uh, we use in our course we taught with Seth Pieta, and it's a, on mathematical ecology, I guess, quantitative ecology? Quantitative. Mm -hmm. So today he's going to talk about ecological dynamics and therapeutic impacts of bacteriophage, a not-so-perfect predator. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and uh, reinforcing the reminder, because I was supposed to be here, but due to the pandemic, uh, it got a little hard to do the travel, so I'm happy to be back. I, I believe I was here last in person December 2019. I've been here for a few other courses online since then. Obviously, it became much harder to travel in the interim. So uh, today I'll talk about a different topic for those of you, many familiar faces at this point who have been here for the course, and for those of you who are just coming for this colloquium, welcome. My background is in physics. I work in a biology department. I've worked in biology departments now for you know, almost two decades. And I will try to give you a flavor today of another feature of our work on ways in which microbes get sick too. They're infected by viruses. And we are interested in understanding the consequences of these viral infections across scales. Okay, so just to give you a sense of the other things we do, we work on microbial ecology evolution, virus dynamics, both in therapeutic and ocean contexts. Uh, so a variety of contexts, including one in which I think when, when there's ever a virus lecture, especially these days, we think we know what we're talking about when we talk about viruses, and that's usually viruses of humans, right? So whether it's Ebola or Zika or influenza. And for the past few years, when we're talking about viruses, for the most part, we've been talking about SARS-CoV-2. And even this past week in this course, that's largely what we've been talking about. I'm not going to give a lecture on that for those uh, who have been here this week. You're, you're already getting uh, some taste, but for those of you who haven't been here for the week or just here for this colloquium, just to point out, since December 2019, we've been occupied by many problems, one of which has to do with risk assessment, trying to figure out estimates and communicate the estimates of how many people might be infected in group sizes so as to help individuals make better choices about if they should go to events and what they should do when they're there. We've also developed some uh, methods as well as implementation for asymptomatic testing as mitigation. And we've also worked quite extensively on this link between awareness of disease epidemics, fatigue, and the consequences thereof. So I've just given a, a sample, and for those who've been in this space, it's been a very, very intense few years. It's finally calming down in many ways. Uh, but with respect to today's topic, what I'm going to... Oh, actually, I forgot. There's two more things I added in. For those of you this week, uh, this is sort of the basis for what we've been trying to do, this mini course on epidemic modeling for pandemic pre preparedness and prevention involving Ana Bento, Renato Coutinho, unfortunately wasn't able to be in, in person, uh, and Roberto Krenkel. And we still have one more day left. So for the students here, we still have a hands-on session this afternoon with some coding uh, and tomorrow as well. And since Nathan mentioned it, I just want to point out that finally, after a very long time, this is going to be available for adoption. So the methods of the hands-on workshop that you're doing today are similar to the spirit of our effort to do this across many modules. I'd like to think for people from physics, math backgrounds, this is a different way into the life sciences where we work on examples across scales and we have companion laboratories in Python, MATLAB, and R. So yes, I'm actually trying to push this book. So my hope is that students uh, can benefit from it and, and use it in years to come. So this should be coming out in, uh, in spring of 2024. Okay, so viruses don't just infect us, they infect organisms across the diversity of life. You know, humans, mammals, birds, obviously plants, insects, and so on, but also microbes. So again, microbes get sick too. And this has been known for 100 plus years, specifically in the case of viruses of bacteria. They were discovered indirectly through a process of looking at things that seem to be microscopic, smaller than bacteria, that nonetheless cleared bacteria on, on a petri dish. And they were termed bacteriophage, or phagos, from the Greek meaning to devour. So these small things were somehow devouring uh, the bacteria. They weren't necessarily devouring it, but they were infecting it and killing it. In the 1940s, phage in particular, these bacterial viruses, were used as the basis for many discoveries in molecular and cellular biology. This is one of the most famous examples by Luria biologist and Delbrook a physicist. And I just want to point out without going into all the details, because I, I have an ambitious hour ahead of me here, or 50 minutes, we'll see how I do, to try to give you a grand tour uh, before the, the cookies. 
you'll notice that this is an experiment with many replicates. The numbers denote the number of virus-resistant colonies on a plate. So you expose these bacteria that should be sensitive. They should all die, but they don't all die. And when you do the experiment many times over, you don't get reproducibility. So again, this is the sort of PhD student dilemma. You do the experiment multiple times, totally different answers, right? And these are the things you don't want to tell your PhD advisor, but actually this is the hallmark that these mutations that led to resistance were already pre-existing before you exposed the bacteria to viruses. And that's why in some cases, none of them were there. In some cases, those mutations which are independent of selection arose early and led to this proliferation, this jackpot, okay? So just to highlight it there, you see some cases you get zero, sometimes you get many hundreds of resistant colonies from the same experiment. This was the basis uh, for them in part getting a Nobel Prize in 1969. Well-known study. Uh, what is less well-known is that Luria followed up on this work and decided to go through a sequence of having bacteria that were sensitive to virus, selecting for those bacteria that were resistant to virus, and doing the same thing for the virus. So now you had a host range mutant of phage that could infect new types of bacteria. What you'll see here is that the, these oval-like things are the bacteria and the squares of the viruses. The solid arrows denote the, abil the ability of a virus to infect a bacteria, and the dash means some evolutionary relationship. And what you should take away here is that in this process, the viruses could evolve to be able to infect new hosts, right? That their ancestral type could not infect, and you see this in multiple examples. And the bacteria evolved to become resistant to some of these viruses to the point at which a phage-resistant host strain emerged, they couldn't find necessarily a viral type that could infect it. This idea that there was this co-evolutionary arms race, but perhaps the bacteria were in the lead, became a dominant paradigm for decades. So for decades, this dogma persisted. The co-evolutionary potential of virulent phage is less than that of their bacterial hosts. In other words, yes, these are great organisms to study for molecular and cellular biosciences, but maybe ecologically they're less important because you have this potential for the bacteria to gain resistance, the virus can't keep up, so we shouldn't find that many viruses in the environment. And this changed in the late 80s with, I really think this paper gets a lot, should get a lot of credit for it. This is a micrograph of anything containing DNA is stain positive, note the, the length scale, about one micron, and if you look carefully you'll see uh, some circular items that are much smaller than the scale bar that seem to be uh, contain DNA. And you'll notice that there are these helpful arrows which were not in the sample. They were added afterwards to help your eye find them. And does anyone here know something, a student know something that's about 50 nanometers in size? It's circular and contains DNA. Uh, a virus, right? So what this group did was take this natural sample and in a culture-independent fashion, just using these micrographs and counting, began to count up the number uh, of these viruses in the sample, and then based on how much they used uh, in this small frame, estimate the number of virus-like particles that were in the sample as a whole. And they got this estimate of 250 million virus particles per milliliter, and that's already a lot, right? That's just a tremendous amount. And it's notable in two senses. First of all, I mean, if you look in natural environments, largely in the surface, you get estimates that are closer to 10 million per milliliter. So yes, this is a rich sample. It's not out of the, entirely out of the ordinary. It's a bit high, but 10 to the 7th per milliliter is actually quite typical. What's particularly notable is that this estimate was 1,000 to 10 million times higher than previous reports. So what did they do differently? Like, why hadn't people seen this before? The typical way of, of trying to assess how many viruses there were in a sample was to take because these are obligate intracellular parasites, was to take a putative host, let's say E. coli or Vibrio, depending on the particular sample, take your environmental sample, filter it, some size filtering, and then try to see how many phage colonies, which are called plaques, grew on this lawn of bacteria. But you have to have the right host in order to get the viruses to propagate. And so if you choose the wrong host, you can't culture the host, or the host is not the right host for the specific virus you have in the sample, you get these dramatic undercounts. So when people start to look, they see this again and again, you'll find that there are abundant viruses in natural environment. Again, 10 to the 7th per milliliter is quite typical. Again, you can swallow the seawater. It's not going to hurt you because of the viruses. Uh, most of these viruses are viruses of marine organisms. Uh, 
And when you mix them together in culture, this is an example of viruses of EHUX, it can rapidly lyse cultures. And in this particular case, you get these shelled organisms releasing the materials, and you end up over time accumulating things that we can see either from space, uh, you can actually, see, or they form enough that they're, uh, they create geological structures as well. So here we have an example of this EHUX alone growing fine. You add the viruses and it can collapse the culture. Not only do viruses kill individual cells or have these population level impacts, when they release debris, that debris can then be taken up by other organisms. So for example, if you release a bunch of dissolved organic matter, then heterotrophic bacteria can remineralize it. So what you're doing is keeping uh, organic matter small, keeping it in the microbial loop, rather than having a big grazer come and eat that cell, which eventually might be pelleted out. So there's been quite a lot of work now on ways in which viruses may impact things like the carbon cycle. If you want to learn more, and my book may be, the, the, the prior book was on quantitative viral ecology. There's a very accessible book by Carl Zimmer called A Planet of Viruses. It can be read in an evening. It's, it's quite an easy read. You can probably find a paperback. And just to point out, that's a cyanophage. So the cover is a marine virus. It's, it's obviously not drawn to scale. There are many different morphological types, and these things become interesting for all sorts of reasons of the kind I just described. But there's another reason there's been a revival of interest in understanding phage ecology, is that these viruses, depending on their host, may also be therapeutic candidates. So there's, as I will explain in today's talk, an increasing number of drug-resistant, antibiotic-resistant pathogens or multi-drug-resistant pathogens. And one of the ideas is to start to use viruses that are specific to those pathogens as an alternative either alone or in combination with antibiotics. In this one example, this is Paul Turner on the, on the lower left, um, who discovered a means by which you could use antibiotics and phage together. And I'll just give you the brief version of the story. These pathogens, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, are drug-resistant because they have an antibiotic efflux pump. They pump out antibiotics, but the virus receptor to get into the cell is that efflux pump. So if you add them both together, the bacteria that have the efflux pump are killed by the virus. The ones that delete or somehow downregulate the efflux pump are killed by the antibiotics. So combination therapy on this particular class of pathogens has been, worked, has been used um, in compassionate use in multiple cases. And there's a well-known case of a phage cocktail um, that was given to this uh, gentleman, Tom Patterson, who was in a coma with an Acidobacter baumani infection and found host-specific viruses that were then used and added intravenously, and, and he recovered. And in fact, he and his wife then together wrote this memoir called The Perfect Predator. Right? So this idea that you have this naturally occurring virus that could be perfect at finding its host and eliminating it, and it's been underused in terms of medical applications as well. Okay, so that's a brief tour overview of, of this area. And so what I'm going to try to do today is unpack this a little bit, including the premise, and explain why phage are far from perfect predators, right? They wouldn't be as interesting to study. We'd probably be using them all the time, so there's obviously some challenges there. I'll then go take those principles, ecological principles of virus host dynamics, and apply them to the case of phage therapy. How can phage therapy work or why it may not work in light of eco-evolutionary constraints? And then I'll finish up, hopefully, with some ongoing work we're, we're exploring in marine systems of inefficient killing or even the absence of killing when viruses don't necessarily kill their hosts and why. Okay, those are my uh, three uh, aims for today. Uh, and I'll just assume if there are questions, people will raise their hands. So and we'll take it from there. Great. So to get everyone on the same page, just want to explain the life of a bacterial virus. So here we have this passively diffusing virion, which comes in contact with the cell, injects its genetic material into the cell, which begins to take over the host cell machinery, replicate, and then through a, a process of self-assembly, forms capsin, capsids that are, 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 are full with the DNA or RNA of the bacteriophage. And then there's a time process by which either a hole in makes a hole in the inner membrane, and then a lysin makes a, a hole in the cell wall, and out go the virus particles back, and we have a complete life cycle once they go and find a new host. So this is death of this individual cell, but this doesn't necessarily mean the death of the population. We have to treat this individual level picture and put it into a population level model. 
And we're going to do so in a very simple environment here. In other cases, we work in spatial environments, but I'm going to focus largely on these well-mixed cases in today's talk, in which we imagine a resource or some carbon source which is being flowed in through this chemostat at some rate omega with some density r naught, uh, and we have outflow, so everything in the chemostat is flowing out at a rate omega, the resources, the cells, and the viruses. Nutrients are being consumed, turned into new cells. The cells can be infected, and here the virus particles are removed temporarily from the environment, but then there's a burst of size beta back into the environment. Right? So we have, in, in essence, a predator-like virus that is infecting or predating upon a target cell, which itself is, is living on some resource. When you combine these together, unsurprisingly, you get these counterclockwise-like cycles. This is in a log-log scale. Prey, the bacteria, and predator, the virus. In other words, you have many bacteria, which leads to the proliferation of the viruses, which drive the bacteria down. As bacteria become sufficiently low density, the viruses don't encounter enough, and they're slowly washed out of the chemostat. When they get sufficiently low, the bacteria can recover, and we get these counterclockwise cycles for the same reason that you expect them, and you've heard about Lock of Volterra-like dynamics in your classes. Okay, so that's that idea. But, of course, there's some problems with this representation. Right? When we have an explicit infected class, we might want to change this model. I've gotten rid of the resource layer and now have cells, infected cells, and viruses. Here we have some saturating logistic-like process. Here we have, again, this chemostat-like term. Infections now lead to an explicitly infected cell, which lyses at some rate eta. Remember, there's still outflow with a burst size of beta. And when we combine these, we also get counterclockwise cycles, but now we have true limit cycles, and they're attracting. I want to point out that just because you have a virus and it can infect a cell doesn't mean inevitably that you're going to have replication at the population scale. Whether or not you see this kind of dynamics depends on whether a small number of viruses can invade. And if you do, whether it's a next generation matrix approach or you linearize the system, this nonlinear system about the virus-free equilibrium, you get this condition. This condition algebraically may seem a little bit boring, but it has a nice interpretation. We can think of a virus particle and ask the question, how many virus particles will be produced on average across its life cycle, both outside and inside cells? So if we have a virus particle, it will adsorb to a cell this fraction of the time. In other words, we have cells at some density n, which we're eventually going to replace with K here, but uh, so at, at, in the virus for equilibrium, this N becomes K, we have a fraction of time they'll absorb before washout. Once they're in, they will lyse before the infected cell is washed out, and they will produce beta virus particles. And we get a loop. And if this average value is greater than one, then this is the same criteria you get from the algebraic approach. You could also start inside cells and ask the question of how many new infected cells will you get, and you get the same answer. Here you say, well, I have an infected cell. This is a probability it lyses before washout. It makes this many virus particles, and this is how many infect new cells. Either interpretation, the cell-to-cell, -cell, the virus-to-virus the virus life cycle, uh, makes sense in this context. Okay? So as long as that is greater than one, you expect this to happen. And likewise, this is one extreme because in this example, you have an exponentially distributed lifetime of infections, which seems a bit unrealistic. You can take another extreme example in which you have a delayed differential equation, so you have a fixed amount of time tau, and then you have to think about the fact that not all of the cells that were infected tau ago remain to lice. That's why you have this e to the minus omega tau term. And of those that do lice, they produce beta, and again, although Quantitatively, it's somewhat different. You again get the same qualitative result of this counterclockwise cycle. Okay. So folks have tested uh, these ideas in the laboratory. Again, in chemostat-like settings, this is an example uh, from phage T4 and E. coli B. Note the time scale here of about 200 hours, and viruses are in red and, and bacteria are in blue. And what you should see are large-scale oscillations of the order of two or three orders of magnitude, despite the fact that this is a constant inflow chemostat. So all these oscillations are being generated endogenously 
not from the outside, but somehow cycling nutrients, resources, or other features. And you'll also notice that these virus peaks tend to follow the bacterial peaks. So here we have big bacteria, then high bacterial densities, viruses explode, hosts crash. As hosts are low, these viruses wash out. You'll notice these slopes are all in parallel. They're just being washed out of the chemostat because there aren't sufficient contacts. And you see it again and again. What's interesting is that this lasts until about time 200 hours. This is the same experiment. And yet at time 200 hours, something happens. And we get a shift in the dynamics. Right? Same experiment, same chemostat. And yet all of a sudden, now the viruses are going up and down. And the bacteria is basically remaining steady. Now, this seems a little bit odd. Does anyone, uh, any, any of the students want to speculate on what this might be? What happened or changed? Oh, wait, I'm asking the students first, but we're all students at heart. Yes. Just yell it out and I'll repeat it. Say again. Uh, some, the, the speculation is either some immunity probably means some resistance. Immunity might mean something a little bit different, but I, I get the idea. What were you going to say? So evolution, maybe there's some evolution of resistance. Okay, so let's say that were true. If the bacteria were now resistant, let's use that word, not immune, but the immunity can make sense, but in this case, let's say resistance, then if these were resistant, why do we see the viruses recovering? Or maybe the viruses are changing. Maybe not all the bacteria are, are resistant. Okay. So, this is what the group suspected, that there had been evolution of resistance and that they were not all resistant. In other words, why have the viruses recovered? So they ended up isolating these two different types of bacteria in the system, one that was susceptible, one was resistant. It turns out the resistance came with some growth costs. If it came at no cost, it might have overtaken the whole system. And what they then did was track the subpopulation of resistant versus susceptible hosts. And now what you can see is that you have these Laca Volterra-like dynamics of viruses and susceptible hosts. And the resistant hosts, though, are at a higher density. So if you imagine adding the two blue curves together, you would get noise in the background. So this is uh, an example of cryptic-like dynamics where we have now not just a two-dimensional dynamic, nonlinear dynamical system, but it's really a three-dimensional nonlinear dynamical system. And we saw that flat curve because there were these lower level of oscillations happening in the background. Yep. Yeah, so the, the, there are some limits. I think this is partly a density issue. So that it's not just that the, the phase has shifted. You'll also even notice that some of the duration of the oscillations can change. So there are other consequences when you change total population density and some of the other traits. It ends up impacting the duration of the oscillations. But in this case, there's also some limits. I wouldn't entirely trust some of the resolution of the timing. If you looked carefully, some of the virus and host peaks seem to peak at the same time in the earlier one. There's a limit to the resolution of the sampling. But yes, in general, the change in the densities then ends up having an effect on the phase as well. Right? In general, you expect quarter phase shifted, so that's the canonical, but it, doesn't, it can be earlier that depending on the feedback. Yeah. Okay. Good. So what I've done here is also supposed to be put in light of this notion of viruses as a perfect predator. Yes, they can kill individual cells, but that doesn't mean that they eliminate whole populations. In fact, from a conceptual point of view, they're obligate intracellular parasites. It's very hard to kill off all of your uh, hosts because you're self-limiting. And in, in practice, they coexist with host populations. We certainly see viruses and microbes together. I'll give more data on that later in the talk. And not only that, when you mix them together, you can select for resistant types, which means that the total population goes back almost to what it was before. Right. Okay. So maybe they're not perfect after all. That's okay. That makes them more interesting to study. Okay. So this is some of the principles I just wanted to get everyone on the same page with before I get to the two application side. So how repeatable are these experiments? How what? How repeatable are these experiments? So I guess the question is, uh, how many people want to repeat the experiments? versus are they repeatable? So I can't answer the way I framed it, meaning there's been a few studies, and this were done in chemostats in the 90s, we certainly can get repeatable uh, 
emergence of resistance, but there's some level of non-repeatability of the timing of the resistance and the magnitude. I mean, this is a stochastic process. I don't know if you, that's what you mean by it, or just yeah, like... so when you say 200 hours, is that something canonical? Or is that uh, no, that's physics? just in that particular case, right. Yeah, okay, that's what I was trying to figure out what you mean by repeat. This notion of emergence of resistance, absolutely. There are many examples. Um, Co-evolutionary dynamics that lead to a host range expansion, absolutely repeatable, but the timing, of course, it's a stochastic process. There are other examples of which you can get acquired immunity, and I'm not talking about that today, and even that can be, um, it's also stochastic because the acquisition process is stochastic, so some of those details are not quite repeatable. And as I said, the first slide I showed you is an example of repeatable unrepeatability, right? Like you expect it to be, uh, because it's not a Poisson distribution, it has this long tail, and that's a feature. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about efforts to take these ideas and apply them to the realm of phage therapy, ideally hoping to improve the use, uh, appropriate use of phage therapy in clinical settings. And this is an old idea going back to uh, Felix Darrell, along with Tort, one of the uh, attributed co-discoverers of phage, who immediately recognized that if you had viruses that could kill bacteria or something, you know, this phage that could kill bacteria, you could use it potentially therapeutically here to treat Shigella kind of bacterial dysentery. There are now many threats that are multidrug resistant, and, and the CDC, WHO classifies them in all sorts of ways, and these may be threats because, A, the harm caused, the uh, lack of availability of, of, of viable antibiotics, uh, and also the number of multidrug resistant mutations that are now circulating. Uh, and they classify these as both urgent and serious threats. In response, there are a number, this is both in the U.S., South America as well, but it really U.S. and Europe are some of the strongest advocates for this, as well as the former uh, Soviet Union state of, of Georgia, not Atlanta, Georgia, but uh, Georgia in the former Soviet Union, where you'll see efforts being made to develop and apply phage therapeutically in, in, in controlled clinical uh, trials as well as in compassionate use cases. So let me give you an example of some in vivo data and what this looks like in practice. So this is all work by, done by Laurent de Barbieu, uh, taking a phage that can infect and lyse a multidrug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, opportunistic pathogen that can be found all over the place. And the advantage of this particular case is that you can measure the bacterial lobe because it's a bioluminescent pathogen, but this particular strain is bioluminescent. And so without sacrificing the mice, you can actually look at a time course of, of a control mouse or an exposed mouse over time. And this looks like the control case. This is without phage. Here's phage at two hours, and then after four hours and six hours, and you can already see some of the difference in terms of the bioluminescence, and therefore, once calibrated, the bacterial load that's present in the control versus the treated cases. When you look at outcomes, survival over time, survival percentages, none survive if they're not treated, none survive, though it takes a little bit longer, if they're given a 1 to 10 dose. Once they're given at least as many phages bacteria, or 10 to as many phages bacteria, 100% survive. Okay, so this seems quite promising, right? And also stands in contrast to what I just told you about, right, this emergence of resistance. So we want to both unpack it uh, for a number of reasons. And our approach here is to think not just about the phage and the bacteria together, but also about the context. And the context in this case is the immune status of the mouse. So it's not the only thing that's eliminating bacteria. The other thing that can eliminate them are the uh, innate immune system of the mammal. And so we're going to deal with this uh, multidrug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa with this phage pack P1, which can prevent it. And we're going to then explore what happens when the immune status of the mouse is modulated. And this has been a project that's been going on now seven plus years in collaboration with uh, Laurent and his team, uh, including experimentalists based at Pasteur and theorists based both in the U.S. and France. Okay. People had tried to develop similar models before, again, taking these Laco Volterra like ideas and applying them to a therapeutic context. The idea is you take the model more or less the way I described before. Bacteria are killed by phage and lead to the production of more viruses. Viruses decay and bacteria can reproduce. That's what I'm trying to draw in that sketch. And you can imagine the equations, but I'll show them in a moment. Also, in an uh, in vivo context, the bacteria will stimulate the immune system, which when stimulated can inhibit uh, directly through uh, 
clearance of the pathogen. Okay, so that's the idea. And if you take this model, the original claim was, hey, look, this is what happens without phage. You see the susceptible population, this is a model with resistant, proliferates, and although the immune system would eventually clear it, it passes a threshold, and that threshold would lead to the death of the mouse. However, in this original model, when you add phage, the idea is that it suppresses the susceptible population. However, the resistant population proliferates, but eventually that too goes away. And the total of these never crosses the threshold. There's a bit of a problem here because generically, this model, even without phage, always clears the infection. So if I had moved this threshold a little bit up or changed some parameters, actually, we didn't need phage. And the other feature is that the time to clearance gets longer when you add the phage. So there are a couple features here that seem a bit unstable and tuned to the choices of parameters. Okay, so we took this model, which you can see here, growth of bacteria, lysis, with some immune killing and some stimulation. So in other words, it's the standard Lock of Volterra-like model, except now as there are more bacteria, the immune system gets stimulated. And we added two negative feedback loops. One of which is that the immune system cannot keep stim being stimulated ad infinitum. There's a capacity, a max density of how much neutrophils you're actually going to bring to the site of this infection. So we represent that here. And likewise, when bacteria get high enough density, they can inhibit the action of the immune system. This is why we need drugs in the first place, right? Because there are virulence factors, biofilms, and other mechanisms by which bacteria pathogens stop the immune system from somehow clearing it. So we add these two features, and now that we've added them, we can explore what happens in this model using either the phage or the immune system or both together. So if you were to have an immunodeficient version of this system, then you know that we're going to get these oscillations even before the possibility of the explosion of resistance, and I've already showed you that before. So you get coexistence. You don't get clearance. If you get rid of the phage, in this model, because of this negative feedback, the immune system saturates, but it doesn't and it cannot on its own clear the infection. So we're setting up here for the potential value of the therapy. And when we have all the parts together, we end up getting clearance. And the idea is that transiently the phage are drawing down bacterial densities such that it's the immune system that ultimately leads to the sterilization in this case of the system of this in vivo model. And notably, the phage actually disappears before the bacteria. So it's being cleared out at some rate, and it's really the immune system uh, once activated and the bacterial densities are low enough that lead to the clearance. So we call this immunophage synergy. It's not a direct synergy, but it's rather an emergent feature of the tripartite dynamics. The problem we face is that we talked to Laurent about this project, and we thought we could apply it. And when we first apply it to his in vivo model using parameters that we thought were reasonable. We took sensitive bacteria, an immune system, we added phage, and it was a miracle cure. You'll notice it's a very sharp decline, so that's not realistic. Uh, and again, in this case, it didn't really even matter if you had the immune system. So if you just take this in vitro model and use parameters that we get from well-mixed systems that doesn't seem to work, and the way we tried to deal with this is noticing that we had this linear response that as we add more phage, we get more killing. But in fact, this is not being applied in a flask. We have a heterogeneous network. And so what we did is take some ways to slow down the mixing. And we slow down the mixing in a few ways. In other words, as phage increase, we don't think we just uh, phage in one part of the lungs will get to the other lobe immediately. So we, in some sense, slow down the mixing rates. Yep. Sorry, if I understand correctly, you have two immune systems, both the bacterium uh, immune system and the, also the individual. So we're I, in this, I don't know if I understand yeah, so the question is, what about the immune systems? Um, we're treating bacterial resistance as surface resistance. So it's not an immune system. Uh, in, bacteria do have CRISPR-Cas immunity, but this is a case in which a bacteria can have a mutation that means that the phage doesn't adsorb to it. So I'll show you an example in which then we'd have a resistant type resistant to the phage. But uh, what, what is happening? We have a, an individual, a, an animal with its immune system. Correct. And, oh, that's the immune system you're... Uh, that's the, the immune okay. system is the no, immune understand. system of the animal. Sorry. Okay. Ah, that was the question. Exactly. Phage, okay. immune system of the animal. The, then I have a 
then okay, I have a Okay, then you have another question. Good. Yes. Uh, the immune system of the animal uh, doesn't attack the phage as well? So uh, it, it could. It could. But in this case, in fact, they tried assays in which they just added phage and didn't add bacteria, and you don't see a cytokine response, though there's a resident time. So it is true that there are some nonspecific responses, like macrophage just taking up whatever's there, and so it may accelerate it relative to the typical decay, but we don't seem to see a specific immune response against the phage. So you're asking me, why wasn't there a negative feedback loop here? And that's the reason why. Okay. So we included the characteristic residence time, but we didn't find ex evidence for a specific response in the way there is one to the bacteria. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Right. Yeah, because you're probably thinking like, HIV, other viruses, there are, you know... Yeah, the, real-life obligations. Right, so if you had that negative feedback loop, that would be problematic, right? Exactly. Uh, so, but in this case, we don't seem to see the cytokine response. Okay. okay, good question. Good. So if we take, and now you'll see what I mean exactly by resistance, if we take phage that can only inhibit the sensitive type, and we have resistant and sensitive types, the immune cells act on both. What we end up seeing when we slow down the interactions is the following. Phages are increasing, the sensitive bacteria is collapsing, there is a proliferation of these resistant types. Why don't they keep proliferating? There are no phage that are going to attack it. The reason is that the total population has grown low enough that now they don't have this density-dependent density inhibition. So an activated immune system, once the virus clears out the sensitive bacteria, can control the small subpopulation of resistant types. So this helps to settle this kind of question that in a 24 to 36 hour time frame, we could expect to see resolution. And even if there's a small set of resistant bacteria, they're not necessarily going to proliferate when the immune system is active. But that's, the, and this is important because it, it's not to say that the resistant isn't accessible. I'll show you in a moment, it is. It just doesn't seem to proliferate. Okay. So that also explains that piece. And so the next piece is, well, what are the effector cells, which is the actual part of the immune system, the mammalian immune system that's involved here? One of the interesting things they did was to make the mice be devoid of innate lymphoid B cells and T cells. So you can use all these different mice models that are missing parts of the immune system. This is a big gap in the immune system. Nonetheless, even uh, when you add phage in, this my, in these mice that are devoid of B cells, T cells, and A lymphoid cells, the vast majority survive. So it implies that the synergy is with some other part of the innate immune system, and it was likely to be neutrophils. And so when you use uh, uh, antibody drawdown and deplete the mice of, uh, of the neutrophils, what you can see now is that when you add phage in this neutropenic mouse, that they all die. It's the same phage, same bacteria, but now a different context. And you see a proliferation of radiance in these two models. What you see now is that there's nothing to stop the proliferation of these resistant bacteria. And when they look and, uh, at the mice that then died, and you do colonies, you find that all of the colonies from the mice are phage resistant. So you get this proliferation of, of phage resistance. And just to point out here that we have been taking these models and applying them to entire networks, noticing that there's a very interesting scenario in which we think that the clearance, when it does happen, is happening first at the extremal parts of the network and then propagating up. And we're in the process of, actually, we have just recently found um, images in which you can see now the heterogeneity in the in bioluminescent intensities. And what I hope you should see in these pictures is that you get clearance in the bottom parts of the lungs often well before you get it in the top. And so consistent with some of these metapopulation models, we think that there's also kind of a spatial dimension here as the clearance works from the extremal M's up uh, to the nasal passages of the animal. Okay, so the takeaway point is that phage can reduce populations significantly uh, through efficient uh, therapeutic control, even if we do not necessarily have phage that can target every type of bacteria in the system, even if resistance evolves, if there's uh, a competent immune system. And in general, the takeaway here is that you need some sort of combination therapy. I've talked about one here today, synergy with the immune system, but we're also working on antibiotic combinations and phage cocktails. And uh, there's, there's more to be said on that.
Uh, and I think I have time probably to wrap up with just one last section on inefficient killing by phage and even the absence of killing by phage in natural systems. Any questions before I move on? Uh, you're getting the whirlwind tour, and it's a warm room to here today. Okay. I'll just keep going and, unless there are urgent questions. There's a question that's urgent? If you were just shout it out, I can repeat it uh, because I know people are online. In the first model that you're showing, there was the resource dynamics also, but then after that, you just skip the resource yes, dynamics. Yes, I, I did, yeah. I, so you're asking, what happened to the resources? I mean, it can get somewhat more complicated. It's a, you, I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader. If you take a consumer resource model and you apply a quasi-stationary state to the resource layer, you end up getting something that has a saturating term that ends up becoming the logistic model. Okay. in certain limits. So that's sort of why I'm playing that game, just to make it a little bit easier. But then it's going to depend also if my resource is self-renewable or not. Absolutely. So in this par these particular example, and it actually depends on something else. So in other ecosystem models, we have a true cycle of the nutrients. Here it's all being, in the chemostat, it's all being input, so it's not as important. But you're right, in certain cases, you'd have to think about recycling, right? You have to think about the entire life cycle, the resources. And the other feature, which I didn't talk about, quite important, is that viral infections themselves depend on resources. So if the host has run out of resources, probably the infection is not going to be that productive. It actually becomes quite interesting. Okay. So let me again, I would go back to the beginning as I move towards the end. I gave this picture on the left of what happens when you have large blooms of EHOX, similar things can happen for algae, similar things can happen for cyanobacteria. In each of these cases, although different kinds of data set, you see you take a host population that otherwise would do fine, you add viruses, the host population can collapse, and viruses can proliferate. And the idea is that if this is happening at one scale, and we get these large-scale impacts, and we were to look then at the aggregate number of cellular deaths caused by viruses, this would have a significant impact, right? And I know I gave you that example of 250 million per milliliter. We've gone back with colleagues and looked at how many virus-like particles are there per milliliter and, and cells per milliliter. And what you can see is that they're typically about 10 to 1 as many, but it ranges from anywhere from 1 to 100-fold as many. In the surface oceans, again, 100 million per milliliter, not impossible, but in kind of Blue water, oligotrophic water, something like 10 to the 7th per milliliter is typical, right? So we have large number of viruses, typically 10 as many, but anywhere from 1 to 100 times as many as the cellular hosts. And I've talked a lot about killing today, that this is the inevitable outcome of these viral infections. So I'm just going to try to unwind that a little bit by asking, do viruses and microbes, whether in the oceans or elsewhere, do anything else other than sort of prepare to kill and kill? And the answer is yes, and that's also been known for 80 plus years, that it's not the only outcome of a, micro, of, of a viral infection of, of a bacteria. This is one of the other things that can happen, something called lysogeny, where after infection, there's a wonderful also kind of physics of the decision making by which viruses, and I'll put in quotes, decide, because obviously it's modulated by the host and the environment, whether to kill the cell or to integrate the genetic material into that of the host. And then as the host divides, so too does the virus, which is called a prophage. And it, as the cell divides, that prophage is inside the genome of the, of the host. But at some point, this prophage is still expressing a few regulatory proteins. It can detect potentially DNA damage to the host and induce itself to get out, reinitiating the lytic cycle. So that's what you're seeing here. Right? So we have lysis on the one hand and lysogeny on the other hand. Okay. And the canonical idea has been that when things are good, there are a lot of bacteria around and a lot of resources that viruses tend to kill their hosts, and when times are bad, that they enter lysogeny. And part of the reason, although it's a bit of a group selection argument, is that it would be better off for the viruses not to kill off their hosts, but it's obviously better to find a Darwinian argument necessarily than, than a group selection argument. Here there's an example called seasonal time bombs, that in periods of high productivity, the summer period, you see a lot of lytic infections and not in the spring. 
And when you add something called mitomycin C that should stress the cells out and then induce viruses to pop out, you can't seem to do it in the summer, but you can do it in the less productive periods. So this has been the canonical idea, or was until recent controversies about an alternative, literally the opposite called piggyback the winner, which says that as density and productivity gets higher, you should have less lysis and more lysogeny. In other words, times are better, a lot of cells around, but now they're not being killed. Okay? This is meant to explain the observation that as microbial densities increase, so too do viruses, but this is the one-to-one -one line. But the ratio of viruses to microbes decreases as microbes increase. Okay? All I'm trying to say is that this one-to-one -one line, it's sublinear on this log-log plot with a lot of scatter that will make uh, people in this audience unsatisfied. And I can have a long story about that as well. However, the issue with this theory has been that in practice, the idea was that microbes grow, they're lice, they die, viruses decay. And the viral release looks like beta phi NV, the product of infected cells that are lice times birth size, but the birth size goes up with N. It's literally going up as a function of N over K. So it's really in practice doing the opposite. The reason why it had this effect is that if you solve for the steady states, the densities do the thing that I just described. It is not the only way you can get that sublinear effect. The other thing we've done is look at the metagenomic evidence is there evidence that we find more lysogeny-associated genes in systems with higher microbial cell density? This data was originally used as the claim that it does. I think you can see that it doesn't. So if I look at microbial cells versus something called provirus-like reads or integrase, that's just something that gets them into the cells, or excisionase that makes a cut and helps them get out, in all of these cases, as density increases, we don't see a big signal that lysogeny is going up, okay? And this has led to all sorts of controversies, but I think the key point is it has re-raised the question of what are the drivers for when viruses should initiate lysis or lysogeny, which I think is quite productive. So I'm going to then ask that question as I wrap up here, which environmental conditions should favor lysogeny rather than lysis, and I will refer to an old adage, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, which again, in different cultures, the multiplier is different, which may say something about the cultures. The idea is that you have something secure, and you're willing to trade it for something that maybe is not as guaranteed, but because it's not guaranteed, you want more of it, right? I believe in Spain, someone told me it's a factor of 100. In Argentina, you can tell me with inflation what it is. See. One bird in the hand, then a hundred flying. Yeah, exactly. Right, so this notion that with uncertainty you need an and again, with inflation, it can cost more. Uh, okay, so here you have a virus. It found a cell, very hard to find a cell. Okay, maybe it's going to lice, but, uh, but at what cost? How many should be in the bloom, and what is N? Like, what's a good amount of cell density for this virus to worth killing and infecting the cell and moving on, maybe rather than sticking to it? So I'm going to go back, and now everyone in the epi class will, will be familiar with this concept. I'm going to go back to the notion of a life cycle and think about this lytically and uh, obligately lytic virus that gets in to a cell and can only kill the cell. And I'm going to call this infected cell the mother virus. So I'm going to call it mother virus. And this mother virus is going to lice and produce all these virus particles, but that's not its fitness because we haven't completed a life cycle. We have to get some daughter viruses which I'm going to say is newly infected cells. And even if 100 virus particles come out, 97 might never make it to a new cell. In this example, 3 made it. So I'm going to call this individual level fitness as 3 and use HOR for horizontal, meaning it's horizontally transmitted. It had to get to new cells. In contrast, a temperate phage that can essentially become latent and pass along with the host, here this mother virus starts to divide and has three progeny cells, each infected with the virus. Their fitness is their own, and then it dies. Someone eats it, it, you know, it somehow dies, a natural cause, whatever happens to that mother virus. This is another way to generate three infected cells without ever causing lysis. Totally different ways of doing it that don't involve counting virus particles, but counting life cycles that start with infected cells and end with infected cells. So if you're a virus, you're coming into this context, found a cell, if there was some way of measuring cell density as a proxy, which is quite interesting viruses can do, how does this depend on cell densities? 
So if we take these explicit models, here we have the individual perspective, the population perspective, you can see that we have a burst after some average time one over eta, and just as I showed earlier, viruses increase in population when this basic reproduction number is greater than one, which I already explained is really just trying to make life cycles from one infected cell back to it, and that's the interpretation. It depends, obviously, on the susceptible population. So even if the birth size is 50, for other parameters, if there isn't a sufficient population, it's not enough, not enough of the virus particles will get out and find new cells, depending on parameters. So clearly here, higher populations are going to favor this lytic mode, right? So more susceptible cells, viral traits that have higher birth size, all of these things favor the lytic mode. In contrast, if we do the same calculation for lysogens, we can also calculate a basic reproduction number, which is just how long this lysogen survives, multiplied by its division rate. That's the number of progeny. And you can see here, this is its division rate. Its average period of survival is 1 over d prime. So you end up just getting a product of this and this. But critically here, now the vertical reproduction number goes down with cell density because the more other cells there are, the more you have to compete with them as a rare lysogen. And so that's what I'm showing here in contrast to the horizontal fitness that goes up as there are more cells. Your vertical fitness goes down. You have to then compete with all these other cells. And I've shown three here, one in which there's a benefit, direct benefit to the cell of being a lysogen. Maybe it improves its growth rate or survival, carries genes with it other where there's a low fitness benefit or even a fitness cost, right? But as you can see, all of these cases, it's better on average to not kill than to kill when the cell densities are low. Okay, which is what I just said there. It turns out that being a temperate phage or having a chronic infection strategy allows you to access both of these routes. And some of our ongoing work is to try to figure out when exactly these strategies should be realized and how they do it. Right. Some phage are actually releasing small molecules into the environment. There's this arbitrium system, which has just recently been discovered. So by the time they infect a cell, there's already a signal that maybe it's time to stop killing, and they radically switch from lysis to lysogeny as a function of the intracellular peptide concentration. So again, low populations, when lysogens have some growth advantage or protect them from, from killing, or high extracellular decay rates, all these favor non-killing modes, and this is potentially a much bigger range than expected. I think we're seeing it's far more common to have these non-lytic modes than previously thought. Okay. The last thing I want to say is that in thinking about these non-lytic infections, we've also tried to explore inefficient infections, a sort of bridge between these polar opposites in the environment. This is joint work with Debbie Lindell and Ilya Medenik at the Technion, and they were very interested in trying to see how much their lab work extended to natural systems. And they have a particular cyanophage system. For the purposes here, the red is clade A and the blue is clade B. Let's just call them red and blue. The birth size cells lysed are listed here. And I think what I'm trying to tell you is that the red is pretty good at making big bursts and efficiently killing cells it infects compared to the blue. In other words, the red is the more efficient killer and the blue is the less efficient killer. They both more or less die at the same rate or decay at the same rate. And what you can see here are these bigger plaques from red than blue. So they expected this efficient killer should be more dominant in the environment because it was both more efficient in killing and more virulent uh, than clade B. But when they went to the environment, these are, uh, these are contours of densities. What you can see is that despite being more efficient, it has far lower densities in these phages per milliliter of this type than does clade B. Okay? So the less efficient type seems to be much more predominant in the environment. And if you build a model, which I won't do because I'm getting to the end of my time, of virulence from low to high, what you see, and this is a trade-off between high virulence, you're producing a lot of viral infections and new vir viruses per host, but you don't have many hosts left because you've drawn them down to such low level. On the other hand, low virulence, you're not as productive for the host you infect, but there are many more hosts around. The product of those two can reflect then how many viruses you expect to see in the environment and their net population level impact. 
In other words, that being less virulent can actually be a more successful strategy in terms of ecosystem level impact and abundance in the environment. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. I think I've used my full time uh, by asking a question, what is a virus? Right? I think before this talk, I think if I asked you to imagine a virus in your mind, you probably would have imagined that capsid, which is why I showed it to you. If I tell you to imagine a chicken, I assume you think of a chicken. It's going, but maybe you should think of the egg. Right? If I imagine, ask you to imagine a tree, do you imagine the physical adult tree or do you imagine the seed? What I'm trying to say here is that if we want to think about virus impacts, we have to think about this charismatic virus particle, but also lysogens, which don't look at all like viruses, but are critically important life cycles, as well as lytically infected cells, what are called virocells. And all of these, I think, are important if we're going to try to figure out the ways that viruses work, both from a principal side, but also applying them for therapeutics and understanding their impact in the environment. And with that, I've used my time. Uh, unfortunately for the students, they have even more of me later today, but happy to take some more questions. Thank you.